trip I'm nothing on my own I make mistakes often slip just common flesh and bones but I'll prove someday just what I say I'm of a special kind when he was on the cross I was on his mind the look of love was on his face the thorn Man, thank you, brother. That was great. And we've been uh, blessed with some good times of worship today. Thank you, uh, Brother Robert, for leading us in worship. It's been good to be with you all. And uh, if you have a Bible, I want you to take it out and find John chapter 14. While you're finding that, I wanted to just uh, follow up on something Brother Mike said. So there is disaster relief training in early October. It is Saturday, October 9th from 830 to 3 at Central Baptist Church in North Little Rock. And you can tell... When people make dates, what their hobbies are. Because it is Saturday, October 9th that that training is, and Saturday, October 16th is open a day of muzzleloader season. <laughs> so you can tell that Randy Garrett has on his mind the muzzleloader season's on the 16th, so he planted on the 9th, you know. And so that, that's what we call good planning, Brother Mike. But uh, in October, uh, uh, you know, there's several things going on with our mission team. The Saturday before that, the first Saturday in October, is the one-day mission trip. I shared with some of you, uh, half of you this morning, that the one-day mission trip in Arkansas has been going on for 11 years now. It's always the first Saturday in October when Arkansas Baptists will focus on one community in the state, and we will reach into that community with different mission efforts. And the power of Arkansas Baptists working together, uh, over the last 11 years, there's been over 21,000 Arkansas Baptists who have volunteered and participated in those days. And this is the most powerful thing, I think, uh, about those days, that the five hours that Arkansas Baptists are working together in those days, if you, if you look at the number of conversions over the last 11 years, during that five-hour period on the one-day mission trip, someone professes Christ as Savior every four minutes that Saturday. 
What a powerful thing that we're able to be a part of as Arkansas Baptist. And so thank you for partnering with us and being a part of that. So that's some opportunities coming up. The one day mission trip. You can go to absc.org slash one day to register for that. You can register for that disaster relief training by finding it on the website. I, I, I was able to look it up and send it to Brother Mike, and so he has that link if you'd like to take a look at that. But there's all kinds of ways to be involved. Since there's so many ways to be involved, there's no reason to just sit the bench, right? I mean, we, we, we don't want to just uh, sit till Jesus comes. We want to serve till Jesus comes. This Sunday is the last. It's, the, it's closing out the week of prayer for Dixie Jack uh, the Dixie Jackson Mission Offering, the Dixie Jackson Week of Prayer. And as we talked about that, the, the video that was shared this morning about ministry that's going on on college campuses, but also the disaster relief ministry that is taking place in Louisiana, that is made possible by the Dixie Jackson State Mission Offering. Do you know that Trinity Baptist Church over the last 10 years has given over $50,000 to the Dixie Jackson Mission Offering? I think that's worth celebrating. Can we give the Lord a hand for that? Let, let me tell you what that, what that looks like uh, for somebody like me. Uh, in 2005, this church, I, I looked at the, the giving record, this church gave over $1,000 to the Dixie Jackson State Mission Offering in 2005. On uh, New Year's Day, so on Sunday, January, uh, January 1st of 2006, I was serving in the Marmaduke First Baptist Church. And on that Sunday evening, that first Sunday in January, we gathered in the altar as we closed out our Sunday evening service, and we prayed for God to do something supernatural in our community that year. Brother Mike, we should have been more specific. Because on April 2nd, an F4 tornado took out the top half of our town, including my house, my in-law's house, the church that I served, the school where my wife worked, and the farm that I worked on. In about 30 seconds' time, all of our normal was gone. But do you know what happened the next day? Because this church gave to the Dixie Jackson Mission Offering in September of 2005, in April of 2006, people with yellow shirts and yellow hats began to show up in Marmaduke, Arkansas and fix meals for us. I've had some of those meals passed out in those styrofoam containers, and I can tell you, they, uh, you don't care what's in there when you're going through something like that. I, I look back at the pictures now of that time, and, and I, I, uh, I, I notice like every picture of me I have on the same outfit because that's all I had. You know, you'd wear it during the day, wash it at night, put it back on the next day. And so really, people who are in tragedy and, and, and going through very difficult seasons, that this offering allows us to stand in the gap for them. It allows us to share the love of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus with them during some of the most difficult times in their life. And so when I hear about the Dixie Jackson State Mission offering, it really resonates with me because I've been through that kind of tragedy, and I know that the people in the yellow shirts and yellow hats were the first ones to show up and start cooking meals, and they were some of the last ones to leave. And so thank you for your faithfulness to give and go on mission because it really does make a difference in people's lives. It's not just numbers and figures on a page, but it is real ministry, real life that's happening right now because of your faithfulness to give. And so when we pray toward the Dixie Jackson State Mission offering, one practice that my wife and I have developed over the years, we take the prayer guide and we take our offering envelope and we just essentially write God a blank check. We just pray throughout the week over the envelope and we say, God, what do you want us to put in that envelope? Whatever you want that check to say, just let us know and we'll put it in there. And he always does. He always gives us an amount. And so I would just encourage you to pray for state missions, pray for the Dixie Jackson mission offering, but thank you for your faithfulness to give. And just a credit to Brother Mike's leadership, just looking at the history, the giving to Dixie Jackson has gone up significantly during your time here. And so thank you, brother, for your leadership in that. Uh, it is making an eternal difference. You know, as we talk about Dixie Jackson, uh, I, I told you this morning that I, I grew up here in Benton, and I grew up at Sharon Missionary Baptist Church. And Missionary Baptists, the way they do missions, it's uh, societal. In other words, our missionaries, they're on the field, and then when they're on furlough, they come to our church and they share about the work. And, and as they share about the work, they ask if your church would like to become a prayer partner, a financial supporter of the work. When I began working in the Southern Baptist Church, Southern Baptists do missions cooperatively. And so through the cooperative program, as we give to missions, our missionaries are able to stay on the field full time. They don't have to be home half the time raising support. They're able to be on the field full time because of the cooperative program. 
But I'll be honest, when I became a Southern Baptist, I, I started hearing about Dixie Jackson and Annie Armstrong and Lottie Moon. And I was like, who are these ladies and why do we owe them so much money? Like, w are we ever going to pay them off, you know? And, and so I, I, I had to invest some time in learning who these ladies are and the story of Southern Baptist. And, and man, I, I really think it's remarkable, God's timing. Do you know the Southern Baptist Convention started in 1845? In 1845, in Augusta, Georgia, uh, members and, and messengers from churches and missionary societies and different groups got together in Augusta, Georgia, and, and they said this in the preamble to the, of the Constitution that, that we are coming together for the propagation of the gospel. So when people ask me, what, are the, what is the Southern Baptist Convention? I, I'm quick to tell them it is not a political organization. We're not trying to legislate morality. It's not a religious organization because religion won't get you to heaven. We are a mission organization. From the beginning in 1845, we said we are Baptist people who are on mission together, and we're going to cooperate together for the sake of the gospel. So in 1845, the Southern Baptist Convention was started, and we started this mission effort together. And do you know right about that time in 1840, a lady named Lottie Moon was born. In 1850, a lady named Annie Armstrong was born. And in 1860, a lady named Dixie Jackson was born. And isn't it just like God to raise up the right people at the right time so his kingdom work can advance? And as Dixie Jackson was born in 1860 in Louisiana, she was born before the war between the states. And after the war between the states happened, there was a lot of damage in and around Vicksburg, Mississippi. So her family moved from Louisiana to Dardanelle, Arkansas. Y'all know where Dardanelle is? Home of the sand lizards, right? Anybody from Dardanelle? Okay, all right, so it's unanimous. So they moved to Dardanelle, and they lived in Dardanelle from 1872. She lived there for about 25 years, and during that 25 years, she met the love of her life and, and married him, and they together had eight children. So she was a busy mom raising eight kids and trying to be active in the life of the church and in the community. And, and they said about her that, that she was such a, a focused woman on her spiritual discipline that there were often times that she would be holding a baby with one hand, holding the Bible with the other hand. Or she'd be rocking the baby with a foot, churning butter with one hand, holding the Bible with the other hand. You know, that's multitasking right, right there, you know. But, but what I see in Dixie Jackson is someone who just lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because this simple woman from Louisiana who moved to Arkansas, who her and her husband had eight kids, uh, after the turn of the century, they moved to Little Rock and they settled into the Second Baptist Church in Little Rock. After settling into the Second Baptist Church there in Little Rock, she became very active in the life of the church, very active in the Women's Missionary Society there. As she became active in that work, a tragedy came to her and her family. Her husband became sick and passed away. But Dixie wanted to make her life count for Jesus, so she continued to live out the mission that God had given her. She remained active in, in the WMU ministry, and around 1912 or so, they named her as the recording secretary. They had a, a meeting in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and the WMU named her as the recording secretary here in the state. It was a position that would later be known as the executive director of the WMU. And as she served in that position, she still had two kids at home that she was raising, but man, she was giving her all for Jesus because, again, she wanted to make her life count. She wanted to live every day on this, or on this, in this life for the day when she would stand before Jesus. And so as she led that, that WMU effort, there came a point in time where she came across some literature that had been written but had never been used. And the idea on the literature was to set aside a season of prayer annually as Arkansas Baptist for missions. And so Dixie Jackson, working with the president of the convention at that time, they launched this effort that every year annually, Arkansas Baptists would set aside a week to pray for missions. And the week of prayer was born in, in that moment. That year, they started praying together as Arkansas Baptists. One week a year, we're going to pray for missions. And a couple years later, they attached an offering to the week of prayer. You know, what, you know what they raised, what their goal was the first year? It was in, it was in 1926, almost 100 years ago. $1,000. Man, that was a big goal, 1926, right? $1,000, a lot of folding money in 1926, right? You know, and, and look how far we've come. Do we think in our wildest imagination that when Dixie Jackson 
led the effort to launch that week of prayer and that mission offering that she ever thought, hey, in almost 100 years, the goal in the state will be 1.85 million. You see, that's our goal this year as Arkansas Baptist is $1.85 million. And I believe God, through you, will do that. Because one thing that we've seen through the pandemic is that the pandemic has not stopped Arkansas Baptist from the mission. It's not deterring us. Your financial faithfulness in the midst of a pandemic is inspiring. And so this year, as we've set aside a week of prayer to pray for missions uh, in honor of Dixie Jackson's legacy, and we take up that offering uh, because that's what she started, that's what she would want us to do, the mission goes on. But when we look back at her life, we see just a simple woman who did what she could do for Jesus, where she was, when she could. And what I see in her life is someone who is just following the prompting of the Holy Spirit every day in every way. And when you have a life like that, the Lord can take what you do in your lifetime and give you a legacy that will last beyond your lifetime. And so when I think of Dixie Jackson, I think of a spirit-filled life. I think of someone who lived according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, who demonstrated the power of the Holy Spirit in her life. And that Holy Spirit that worked in and through Dixie Jackson is the same Holy Spirit that works in and through us. And that's who I would like to talk about tonight. So if you'll join me in John chapter 14... We'll learn some things about the Holy Spirit. It says in John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus is speaking here and he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. You know, as Jesus is meeting here in John chapter 14 with his disciples, as I shared with you this morning about Acts, it's good when we approach a passage to make sure that we understand the context. Like, who is, who is this involving? What's going on here? You see, if we were reading John's gospel as one narrative, we were reading it from start to finish, we would see that John is going out of his way to present Jesus as the Son of God. John, at the time he's writing this, is likely pastoring the church in Ephesus. And as the pastor of a church in Ephesus in Asia Minor, the false gospel coming out of Rome is that the Caesars are the sons of the gods. That the Caesars are both God and man. And that if you will worship Caesar, he will give you peace and prosperity and catch this, eternal life. You know, the best lie the devil ever tells is the one that's the closest to the truth because it's the hardest to distinguish. And so into that culture where that false gospel, that false narrative is coming out of Rome, John writes his gospel to present Jesus in his deity, to present Jesus as the one and only son of God. And as he's writing this story of Jesus as the son of God, we all of a sudden arrive at chapter 13 and Jesus meets with his closest followers and and, and as the son of God, he takes a towel and wraps around himself and he takes a, a, a bowl of water and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. The very Son of God, the Eternal One, the the Word who was in the beginning with God, who was God, the Word who in Him was light and life, this One who spoke everything into existence, the One who, who, who dwelt among us, who put on flesh, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This Jesus, this Eternal Son of God, is taking on the role of a servant to wash the feet of His disciples. Why? He's preparing them. You see, because in John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, this is the last night that Jesus will spend with these men before he is crucified. John chapter 14 is taking place on that Thursday evening in the upper room when they are taking the Lord's Supper together. He's washing their feet and taking the Lord's Supper and he's preparing them for life without him. As Brother Mike said, uh, you know, uh, Mayor Farmer is here and I think Uh, He's got some coaching experience. Do you got any pep talks still stuck in your pocket? I mean, you had some go-tos, right? Like, I love coaches because they just know how to tell stories and they know how to motivate people. You know, one of my favorite coaches was Lou Holtz. 
You know, he coached here at Arkansas, had some success, went on to Notre Dame and had some success. But one of my favorite Lou Holtz stories actually came after a bad loss that his team had suffered. You know, there was a, a bad loss, and, and he was doing the coach's show. And so when he came on the coach's show, he said, uh, Hello, everybody, this is the Lou Holtz show. Unfortunately, I'm Lou Holtz. You know, so sometimes it can be that way. But I know there were times when uh, coaches that I played for, man, they would give you that pep talk, and you'd come out of that pep talk thinking, man, I am 10 foot tall and bulletproof. I am about to, I'm about to put a hurt on somebody right now. I mean, they, they just have a way of motivating you and focusing you. But, but you know that pregame talk, it, it serves two purposes. It's to prepare you, but it's to motivate you. And, 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 and as Jesus is meeting with his closest followers here in the upper room the night before he will die on the cross, this is exactly what he's trying to do. He's trying to prepare them for life and ministry without him. That's why he starts off chapter 14 saying, Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many places to dwell. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going away, but if I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And he says, where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas, the head scratcher, says, Jesus, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't know where you're going, and if we don't know where you're going, how can we possibly know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. But he says, don't let your heart be troubled. That sets the stage. This is where we're at. We're in the upper room. Jesus is with his closest followers. He knows what's happening on Friday. He knows he has a date with the cross that he cannot miss. He knows the souls of every man, woman, boy, and girl who ever has been born, ever will be born, was hanging in the balance. He had to keep his date with the cross. But man, isn't it powerful that his love for these men said on the night before he would have his date with the cross that he wanted to take some time to speak truth into their life and prepare them for life without him. And in that intimate context where they are in the upper room together, Jesus speaks these words that we read tonight where he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. Now that's an interesting thing to say, right? I mean, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and the Father will give you another helper. Well, if we have another helper, then that means we must have already had a helper. In the, in the Greek language, we, we didn't come here for a Greek lesson, right? Like, I, English is my second language. Southern is my first. You know what I mean? And so we didn't come here for a Greek, language, a Greek lesson tonight. But here's what, one thing that I do know. That phrase there, another helper, in the Greek language, there were two ways to say another. There was uh, the, the word heteros, which means another of a different kind. And there was the word allos, which meant another of the same kind. And Jesus uses the word allos here. He said, God is going to give you another helper, and it's another helper similar to the helper that you've already had. And this helper here, this comforter, Man, it's a very specific word that Jesus uses. It's a word that John used here and would later use referencing Jesus. Maybe you've read 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, where he says, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The word advocate in 1 John, the word helper, comforter here in John's gospel is the word parakletos. Now, para sounds pretty familiar, right? Because we know what it means to be parallel, like these two rows of pews, they are parallel. They run side by side. So the helper that Jesus refers to, the parakletos, is a helper who comes alongside. Just like lines are parallel, they run side by side. This particular helper, he comes alongside you and he helps you do what you're doing. And the thing about this helper is this helper helps you do something that you could not do on your own. And so when John points Jesus out as our parakletos, an advocate that we have with the Father, we can put these pieces together. And when Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper of the same kind, we can take from this that Jesus was the first helper and the Holy Spirit would be the other helper. You see, as John began to write his gospel, he wrote in chapter 1, 
He, he said that he came to his own and his own received him not, talking about Jesus. But to those who did receive him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, this Jesus came alongside us. It says that he, he, the, he, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth, the crown jewel of heaven, bankrupt heaven for 30 some odd years. Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God, stepped out of heaven and into time and he put on flesh and he dwelt among us. He came alongside us. He came to us so one day we could go to him. He came to be what he was not so that we could be what we could not without him. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and he became flesh and dwelt among us that we who believe in him and receive him could be called the children of God. Jesus came alongside us to help us. We were lost and could do nothing about it and when we could do nothing about it, Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death and rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Jesus Christ was our alongside helper. He left heaven, came to earth. He didn't just stay in heaven shouting instructions like, hey, don't mess it up. Hey, don't do that. Hey, you're supposed to do it this. No, he, he didn't just stay in heaven shouting instructions at us. He left heaven and came to us to come alongside us as our parakletos, our advocate, our helper. And on the night before he's going to leave, on the night that first alongside helper is, is about to die on the cross the next day and, and, and three days later rise from the dead and 40 days after that ascend to heaven, he wants to promise them, I am going to send you another helper to come alongside you to help you do what you could not do on your own. And so as he talks about the Holy Spirit, this allos parakletos, we see this pattern in Scripture that God the Father is God for us. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. But notice what Jesus says about the Spirit of truth. You know him because presently he abides with you. He had anointed Jesus at his baptism. The anointing of the Holy Spirit was on Jesus his entire life. It says, he is currently with you and future tense, he will be in you. So if God the Father is God for us and God the Son is God with us, the Holy Spirit is God in us. And as Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. We see the Holy Spirit, this alongside helper was coming. Jesus had a ministry. His ministry was to come and die for our sins, to die in our place. And just like Jesus had a ministry, the Holy Spirit has a ministry. He has a reason for coming. And if you're taking notes tonight, I've got two points. You know what's better than a three-point sermon? A two-point sermon, right? Amen. Right. All right. I know the church rules, though. We'll be out by 12 tonight, okay? <laughs> Amen. All right. We all know the church rules. Mayor Farmer and I were discussing that. He's talking about, you know, he didn't want to get anybody's seat tonight. You know, this is a Baptist church. In a Baptist church, even seats are once saved, always saved, right? <laughs> always. We believe in the security of the believer, the security of, of seats, the security of parking spots. You know, we're Baptist through and through. But as we talk about the Holy Spirit, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the first thing that we should mention, he says to these guys who believed in him, he says, you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. But he says the, the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. And so there's this dichotomy that exists here, and, and we will see develop that the Holy Spirit has a ministry to the lost. So if you're taking notes, that's point number one, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the lost. And we're going to kind of go through some of these uh, quickly. And so the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the lost, John would later write a couple chapters later. If you still got your Bible open, you can turn to John chapter 16. If not, it's on the screen, those verses are there. John chapter 16, verse 8. Jesus is speaking, and, and as he's, he's speaking here in John chapter 16, he says, and he, when he comes, talking about the helper, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. 
The Holy Spirit has a ministry to the lost, and Jesus gives us those three aspects of the way the Holy Spirit ministers to the lost. It says that that he will convict the world concerning sin because they don't believe in Jesus. And so the the Holy Spirit, he, he, he convicts the lost of sin. You know, when I was uh, saved, I remember that night after night I would struggle with this, that, man, there's just something missing in my life. I knew the truth of the gospel. I had heard the truth that Jesus lived and died on the cross for my sins and was buried and rose again. And, and, and as a seven-year-old, I couldn't really explain what is this nudging I feel to do something about this. What is this prompting I feel to believe in Jesus and do something about this? And and so one night I went and woke my mom up, and and I'm sure she was thrilled about that, you know. Uh, I I woke her up, and and we went into the living room there, and and she, she shared with me the truth of Scripture. And right then and there, I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. As a seven-year-old, I didn't really understand what that prompting was, convicting me of my sin and my need for a Savior. But now that I'm older, I realize what that was, Brother Mike. That was the Holy Spirit nudging my heart, prompting me to let me know that that I had sin in my life and I needed a Savior. And as a seven-year-old, I I probably didn't pray a perfect prayer, but what I knew in that moment was that I was a sinner and Jesus was the Savior and I needed a Savior. And I knew and believed that Jesus died on the cross to be my Savior. The way I knew that was the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You see, as a preacher, we can preach the truth of the gospel. And I've said before that we can change people's mind, but only God can change the heart. You see, because if I can talk you into something, someone else can talk you out of it. But when God changes your heart... That does an eternal work in your life. Something happens in you uh, miraculously and suddenly, but it's it's eternal. And, And that begins with the process of the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin in your life. And so the Holy Spirit convicts the lost of sin, but also the Holy Spirit convicts the lost of righteousness. And even people who are lost have a basic understanding that some things are right and some things are wrong. Now, in our world today, we tend to argue over where is the line of what's right and what's wrong. You see, some of the things that we would consider wrong, not only would the world say those are right, but they would say those are things that, that should be celebrated. Yeah, but, but, but inside each one of us, the Holy Spirit, the all-present God, he works in hearts and minds and lives to convict us that there is right and wrong. And because there is right and wrong and there is such a thing as sin, that last thing, the Holy Spirit convicts the lost of judgment. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and after this comes the judgment. And so the Holy Spirit convicts us that we need to be ready for what's appointed The Bible says it is appointed for man once to die. It doesn't matter if you're eight months old or 98 years old. We're so glad you're here tonight. All of us have that appointment at some point in time that that we're going to. It's appointed unto man once to die, and we need to be ready for what's appointed. And the reason we need to be ready for what's appointed is because of what's after. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this comes the judgment. And I would ask you tonight, are you ready for that appointment? Are you ready for what's after? The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, We all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and knowing this, we persuade men. You see, there is something that happens in this moment as pastors like Brother Mike stand in the pulpit week after week after week. They stand with with eternity at stake and souls hanging in the balance. And if we were just men getting up here in our power, nothing eternal would ever happen. But there is something significant when a spirit-filled man stands and preaches a spirit-inspired word. And the same Holy Spirit that is filling the man is working the room. You know, that's one thing that makes the Bible unique. The Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture. That means anywhere, anytime the Bible is read, the author is present. And what a wonderful thing to know that when a Spirit-inspired man stands in the gap preaching a Spirit-inspired gospel, that the Spirit who wrote that book and is filling the man is also working in hearts and lives in the room. Maybe the Holy Spirit tonight is telling you something. Maybe the Holy Spirit is telling you, hey, 
I'm a sinner and Jesus is the Savior. Can I tell you that just like I did, I may not have had, I didn't have it all figured out. I didn't understand everything the Bible had to say, but I knew two things. I was a sinner and Jesus is the Savior. If you will confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you'll follow the prompting, the nudging of the Holy Spirit tonight who's convicting you of sin and righteousness and judgment, tonight you can be saved. You walked in here without Jesus. Tonight you can leave here with Jesus. You can leave here knowing that if today is the last day you will spend on this earth, you can, leave, you can live this day and every other day knowing that you are ready for what's appointed and you are ready for what's after because you know Jesus as your Savior. The ministry of the Holy Spirit to the lost is to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. But what about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the saved? I mean, we, we should talk about that too, right? I mean, we, we talk a lot in Baptist pulpits and in Baptist print about what we are saved from. We, we talk about being saved from sin, and we should. We talk about being saved from death, and we should. We talk about being saved from hell, and we should. But do you know what gets too little time in the pulpit and in print is what we are saved to. We're saved from death, hell, and the grave. We're saved from sin. We're saved from self. And, and all of those are wonderful and noteworthy, and we praise Jesus for it. But man, the conversation should not stop there because salvation is not the finish line of our journey with Christ. It's the starting blocks. And so we don't only talk about what we're saved from, but we talk about what we're saved to. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit, when Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you, the helper is going to come alongside you and help you do what you cannot do on your own. You know what I could not do on my own? Save myself. But Jesus was my alongside helper. He came alongside us and dwelt among us and died in our place so he could save us from our sin. You know what else I can't do on my own? live for Jesus, but the Holy Spirit comes alongside me and he locks arms with me and we together, that alongside helper, we do together what I could never do on my own. And so as a saved person, as I think about what I'm saved to, I think about the ministry of the Holy Spirit because I will never live up to what I'm saved to without the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit to the saved, notice in John 14, 26, back here, just a few verses after our original text. Jesus, continuing to talk to these men in the upper room, says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. The Holy Spirit helps us remember the words of Jesus. He helps us remember what Jesus has told us. I mean, that's exactly what Jesus said. So the Helper, the Holy Spirit, he'll come alongside you. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Can I, can I submit to you tonight that the, the transformation that happens when the Holy Spirit has the lead in our life is, is that, that we begin to take the Bible in. And when we begin to take the Bible in, the Holy Spirit helps us with understanding of that. And then he also helps us living that out. So he helps us with understanding and helps us with application. And this is where I think a lot of Christians miss it. They devote themselves to Bible study purely for academic exercise. But the purpose of Bible study is not information, it's transformation. It's Bible in and Bible out. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit, when we spend time with the Lord and we spend time in his word and we read the words of Jesus and, and, and about the life of Jesus and what he did and what he said and where he went and how he lived and how he loved, when we read these things, then in that moment where we are called to love like Jesus loved, our alongside helper helps us remember what Jesus had to say. He helps us remember the words of Jesus. The Holy Spirit in our life helps us remember the words of Jesus. My wife can tell you that I have the sometimers. Sometimes I remember and sometimes I don't. You know what I mean? It seems like the things I can remember are not the things that matter much. Like I'll remember something, my wife will say, how in the world do you remember that? But then the things I'll forget, she'll say, how in the world did you not remember that? So left to my own, I would have no chance at remembering what Jesus had to say. 
but with the help of the Holy Spirit, that alongside helper, he helps me understand what Jesus said, and in the moment I need it, he helps me remember what Jesus said. Like in the moment when a tornado takes your house, and you remember that Jesus said, I will not leave you or forsake you. I will not leave you as orphans. In those toughest times of life, when you're reminded that Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When you're reminded on the days that Brother Mike asked for volunteers, that Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, that Jesus is building his church. He's invited us into that work to help him with that work. In that moment, we are reminded of the words of Jesus. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of a saved person. He reminds us what Jesus has said. So the Holy Spirit helps us remember the words of Jesus. And just as we're tracking with context clues, notice before we transition to chapter 15, the last verse in chapter 14, Jesus says in verse 30, I will not speak much more with you for the ruler of the world is coming. He has nothing in me. He goes on in verse 31, but so the world may know that I love the Father. I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. And so between chapter 14 and chapter 15, they begin to transition. Now, in chapter 18, they're going to be on the Mount of Olives. They're going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane. They're on the Mount of Olives. And so 15, 16, 17 seem to be in transition from one place to another. And this may not be interesting to you, but I find it, I find it fascinating. That, that Jesus, the master teacher, as they're walking from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, they're passing by the Temple Mount. And this is the week of Passover. So it's open I mean, like, there, there, there's people coming in and out of the city. The Temple Mount is open. And, and do you know that on the facade of the temple, there was this really ornate carving? You know what that really ornate carving was? A vine with grapes on it. Can you almost see Jesus as he's walking through the Temple Mount with his closest men pointing to that ornate carving and, and saying, Guys, I am the true vine. And apart from me, you can do that. Just like, just like the, 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 the branch can't bear anything without being attached to the vine, you can't do anything in your life without being attached to me. And as Jesus is walking, man, what a powerful thing that, that, that in, in chapter 15, he's standing there on the temple mount and illustrating to them using something that's on the temple and, and continuing to teach them and prepare them. And in verse 26 and 27, Jesus says, When the Helper comes... Whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me, and you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit, next, he helps us testify about Jesus. Remember in our text this morning in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Like, like if, we, if, we, if we just read that story, we would think, man, Jesus is kind of promising them something, but uh, were they prepared for this? Had, had they heard about this before? When we read these words in John's gospel, we know that the night before Jesus died, he was telling them, hey, the promise of the Father is coming. The alongside helper is coming. He's going to come alongside you and help you do things that you can't do without him. And so when he said, you will receive power, and then you will be my witnesses, I wonder if these words rang in their ears. Oh, yeah, Jesus told us just a few weeks ago that the Holy Spirit would come, the helper would come, and he would testify about Jesus, and he would help us testify about Jesus. And so what Jesus told us about on that night is about to happen. The promise of, of the Father, the Holy Spirit is coming, and he will empower us to testify about Jesus can I tell you that left to myself, I'm not very good at this. I Man, I got to tell you, when it comes to evangelism, like sometimes that icebreaker is hard, isn't it? Like you want to talk about the Razorbacks? I'll, I'll talk till you're tired of listening. I mean, I mean you, want, you want to talk about deer hunting or duck hunting? I'm in. But why does it seem so often that we as Christian people have such a hard time testifying about Jesus? I think it's because we're not submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We're not living a life that is empowered by the Holy Spirit because Jesus said, the helper, the Holy Spirit, that he will testify about me and he will help you testify about me. So I have to conclude as a Christian, if I'm struggling testifying about Jesus, it's because I'm quenching the Holy Spirit's leadership in my life. 
That's convicting to me. Because I'm called to be a witness for Jesus. And so in order to be a witness for Jesus, this is not something I can do in my own power. This is not something I can do on my own. So what I have to make a regular habit in my prayer life is, Holy Spirit, in the moment, help me know you're giving me the opportunity to speak of Jesus. Help me to get that first word out. Because doesn't it seem like if you just get the first word out, it kind of flows from there. But man, why is that first word so hard? But the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he helps us remember the words of Jesus. He helps us testify about Jesus. And, and, and the last scripture we'll look at in John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14, Jesus says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. And so the Holy Spirit, he helps us obey Jesus. He helps us remember what Jesus had to say. He helps us testify about Jesus. And he helps us do what Jesus commanded us to do. He, he helps us to obey Jesus. I'm so grateful for these verses. When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Guide us into all truth as we move and, and, and walk through this life with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide us into the truth in the moment he lets us know this is the right thing for this moment. This is the right thing to do. This is the right thing to say. This is the wrong thing to do. This is the wrong thing to say. i got to tell you, when, when I don't live according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I can be bad guilty about getting my mouth in gear before my brain's in gear. And words are like toothpaste, aren't they? Once it's out of the tube, you just can't get it back in the tube. And so in that moment, I need to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, think with my mind, speak with my mouth, feel with my heart, go with my feet, help with my hands, have complete control over everywhere I go, everything I do, everything I say, because without your help and leadership, I will make a mess of this. As a husband, Holy Spirit, without your help, I'll make a mess of this. As a dad, Holy Spirit, without your help, I will make a mess of this. As a preacher, as a Christian, as a neighbor, as a friend, as a grandson, without the help of the Holy Spirit, I'll make a mess of this. And so the Holy Spirit, he helps us to obey Jesus. And, and, and what that leads to is, is three very quick things. He helps us to live like Jesus. I look at the life of Jesus, I call myself a Christian, which means like Christ, and my only hope at living like Jesus is living according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. But not only does he help me live like Jesus, he helps me love like Jesus. I am incapable of loving you or anyone else with a godly love without God the Holy Spirit helping me to do that. I'm incapable of it. I have to have the help of the Holy Spirit to love you, to love my neighbors, to love my family, to love others unconditionally. And the Holy Spirit helps us love like Jesus. He helps us live like Jesus. Ultimately, the Holy Spirit helps us glorify Jesus. You see, Jesus had said, the Holy Spirit, verse 14 of John 16, he will glorify me, he will take of mine, and will disclose it to you. So whatever he hears, he will speak, he will disclose these things to you. So when we listen to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, he helps us to glorify Jesus. So our sermon in a sentence where we wrap it all up, if you're a big picture kind of person, you say, man, just give me what it all boils down to. So that the Spirit-filled life exalts Jesus in order to glorify the name of God and grow the kingdom of God. You see, as Baptists, sometimes we are scared of conversations about the Holy Spirit. We're, we're scared of, of talking about the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, because we've seen some, some pretty charismatic and, and wild things, and, and we think, man, if, if that's what uh, letting the Holy Spirit lead you looks like, I, I don't want that. Can I just tell you that whenever you read what Jesus has to say about the Holy Spirit, it's not some whirling, dervish, religious experience it is a disciplined and controlled life where everything we do, say, and everywhere we go glorifies the name of God and grows the kingdom of God. The empowered life, the spirit-filled life, 
it, it, it lives like Jesus. It looks like Jesus. It loves like Jesus. It, it exalts Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, when I am exalted, I will draw all people to myself. So the spirit-filled life, it glorifies the name of God. It grows the kingdom of God by exalting Jesus Christ and following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And so where do we end up today? When we've said the spirit-filled church prioritizes the gospel message of Jesus. And we've said the spirit-filled life exalts Jesus Christ. So we end up at the same place that Jesus said we would end up. He said the Holy Spirit would point to me. He would testify about me, Jesus said. He would glorify me, Jesus said. We wind up exactly where the Holy Spirit wants us to wind up, and that is at Jesus. The Spirit-filled church exalts Jesus. The Spirit-filled life exalts Jesus. The question now, does the Holy Spirit have control of your life? If you bow your head and close your eyes, I'm going to ask Brother Robert to come. Uh, the pianist is going to come. Brother Mike's going to be down front here in just a minute. And I would just ask you a question that I asked you this morning. Are you quenching the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life? Are you willing tonight, like the psalmist said, like that song we sing says, search my heart, O God? Are you willing to open up your heart and life and say, God, come into my heart, come into my life, take a look around. Show me, tell me. What areas of my life do not exalt Jesus Christ? In this moment right now, Holy Spirit, I, I pray that you would remind us of the words of Jesus. And you would measure our life according to the words of Jesus. Measure our love according to the love of Jesus. And where we are not like Jesus, Holy Spirit, convict us to change. We want to live a spirit-filled life. God, we want our lives to glorify you. We want our lives to grow your kingdom. The Holy Spirit, have your way in this time. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Mike's going to come. Let's stand and sing this verse of invitation together.